Hello everyone. Uh, today we are going to. I'm going to start a series on the message called the sanctuary. And um, the reason is because I think many of um, my people, Seventh Day Adventists, uh, do not understand the message of the sanctuary. And this is not only for my people, but it's also for other people that are struggling to understand the purpose of the Bible. And so by on, by studying that message called the sanctuary, they are we will we will be able to understand what the Bible has to tell us. And hopefully um let me actually and hopefully uh as we study um some of you that are non Adventist may have an understanding and hopefully that will help you to to have it will help spark the interest in you to study the Bible even more. So right now we're gonna start. Um, let me uh, go to my. Uh, I'm assuming you guys can see my screen. Let's see. Yes. And so what I'm gonna do is we're gonna look at the sanctuary message, and the sanctuary message basically is. It's actually a message that most people actually do not um, understand. And it's very easy, but I think the reason they don't understand the Bible is because um, many pastors are teaching their congregations that, you know what, we are New Testament believers, we are the, we are the New Covenant, and so the Old Covenant uh, that was done away at the cross, uh, we don't have to look at it anymore. But uh, I'm gonna just give you guys an idea of why this is a um, this is a bad way of studying the Bible, because if you think about it, the Bible is a um, a TV show. Okay, it's a TV show that has um, two uh, two seasons in it, and so if you were to look at the TV show, you would first start with the first season or the first, yes first season. And but what the pastors are teaching their congregations is that they need to they have to disregard the first season and just focus on the second season. And so in the Bible sense, the first season is the Old Testament, and the new one or the second season is the the New Testament. And so when people are just looking at the second season, they going they going to understand certain things, but the big picture they are they they lose the big picture. And so when you look at the first season, then you understand why the second season is as it is. In this case, the Bible, the Old Testament is the first season, and it has 39 episodes from Genesis to Malachi. That's the first 39 episodes. And the second season, which is the New Testament, has 27 uh, episodes from Matthew to Revelation. And if you don't understand the first season, then the second season will not you will not understand it completely, and this is where the message of the sanctuary um, brings us the understanding of both first and second season. So as soon as you understand the first season, then you will appreciate the second season, and that's why we I wanted to make that this little connection, so people don't assume that um, the Old Testament. Is no longer important. We don't have to look at it anymore. Actually, it is more important now to look at the Old Testament so we know how to live in the New Testament because right now we are still in the New Testament. So, without um, any any further talk, I'm gonna start. We're gonna go and I'm gonna start the the presentation. And so, the method of the sanctuary, um, the first, the first, uh, the first PowerPoint or the first. I would say slide, not slide, PowerPoint presentation, is something called the altar of sacrifice. And you may actually not know that the Bible actually speaks about the altar of sacrifice. And if I were to ask you right now what the altar of sacrifice is, you would have no idea what I'm talking about because you probably never even studied it. And I think most Christian churches that are non-Adventist, at least I would say most Christian churches 
Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, um, Episcopal, Anabaptist, uh, Methodist, uh, uh, Anglicans, and Catholics, and all of these other churches that focus on the New Testament will never know what it means to talk about the sanctuary message. As a matter of fact, I went to a discount tire one time to get a new tires in my car, and then there was a lady that sat next to me. And I was reading a book called um, the Manual for. It's a book for elders in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Well, I forgot the name of it. I don't know for some reason. I don't know why. And she she asked me what I was reading, and I told her what, what I was reading. And so we started having a conversation on religion. And I asked her, you know, I said, so question, do you know what the sanctuary message is? And she said, what? Say that again. I said, it's okay. I, I know your reaction. I wouldn't. I would assume you wouldn't know it. And so I started to show her what the message is, and it's an interesting message. So, the altar of sacrifice. What is the altar of sacrifice? Well, I'm going to start by quoting uh, a book called. Actually, before I read that, let me actually give you a picture. So right here, here you are looking at a picture of the sanctuary, and it has basically three people. Three parts. There is the um, so when you look at the gate, the gate is on the east. Okay, so when you enter the sanctuary, you enter through the gate on the east. There's only one gate. Okay, and interestingly, there's only one gate to get to heaven, and that gate is Jesus Christ. So I'm just giving you some idea of what the message of the sanctuary is, so you, so you can start to rejoice in that message because as soon as you understand that message, I can assure you. You're going to love the Bible even more. So when you get to the gate on the east, the first thing you find is the altar of offering or altar of sacrifice. And, and then after you pass the altar of sacrifice, you get to the bronze laver. And if you look out on the left of it, you're going to see it says courtyard. So that means when you enter the gate of like, think of it as when you enter uh, somebody's house. As you enter the gate, you get to the court, to the yard, to the courtyard or back backyard, things like that. And then you enter the first door, which is to the living room or a kitchen or something like this. You get the point. So here we have the altar of offering or altar of sacrifice. And then you get to the bronze liver. After you pass that part, you enter inside of the temple where you find the holy place, the golden candlesticks, the showbread. Or also called the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and then after you pass beyond the altar of incense, you get to the most holy place, which is the ark of the covenant, and that is where God is. And so, if you enter the if you enter the sanctuary from the east, which is where the gate is, then you go in west. And I'm not gonna say that, but there's a message in the Bible called east to west as well, but that's for another time. And so, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to read in this book called um, Review and Herald, uh, November 22nd, 27th, 1883. It says, In his word, God has revealed saving truth, meaning in the Bible, God has revealed saving truth. As a people, we should be earnest students of prophecy, we should not rest until we, we become intelligent regarding the subject of the sanctuary which is brought out in the visions of Daniel and John. And this is why right now I am making that, that series on the book, or on the message of the sanctuary because when we are done with that and we go to Daniel and Revelation, we're going to see the sanctuary again being played out throughout the whole book, meaning the Bible. Not just in not just in uh, in prophecy, but in every other aspect in the Bible, you will see the message of the sanctuary being repeated over and over and over. Now, this subject this subject sheds great light on our present position and work, and gives us unmistakable proof that God had led us in our past experience. Talking about the Great Disappointment in 1844. It explains our disappointment in, 18, in 1844, showing us that the sanctuary to be cleansed was not the earth as we had supposed, 
but that Christ then entered into the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary and is there performing the closing work of his priestly office in fulfillment of the words of the angels to the prophet Daniel. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And we're going to get there, but for right now, we're not gonna, I'm not going to explain that part because when we are done with the sanctuary, we're going to look at the book of Daniel. And then we're going to understand what that means, that 2300 day prophecy. So let's actually move on to the next slide. Now, again, to continue uh, on Review and Herald, November 27, 1883, our faith in reference to the message of the first, second, and third angels was correct. The great way marks we have passed are immovable. Although the host of hell may try to tear down from their foundation and triumph in the thought that they have succeeded, yet they fail. These pillars of truth stand firm as the eternal hills, unmoved by all the efforts of men combined with those of Satan and his host. We can learn much and should be constantly searching the scriptures to see if these things are so. And that's one thing most people, most churches do not do. Most people actually go and then they listen to the pastor or to the priest talk and talk and talk and talk. And they never go back to the Bible to see if what they were saying was true. And many of them are being misled by this. God's people are now to have their eyes fixed on the heavenly sanctuary where the final ministration of our great high priest in the work of the judgment is going forward, where he is interceding for his people. Let's move on. Now, the altar sacrifice. Remember, again, I showed you right here on the right. You see, you have the, um, the courtyard, which is the earthly altar and liver. And... I will, I will, I'm going to explain to you why it's earthly and why it is uh, in, in the other one after I read this part on the left. Now, the altar of sacrifice. The first part of the sanctuary is the altar of sacrifice. Basically, where is the altar of sacrifice or what is the altar of sacrifice? Well, the altar of sacrifice is where we do the cleansing of ourselves. And I'm going to explain that as well. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord excuse me, and took off every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offering on the altar. So, why is the altar sacrifice located outside of the door, by the door? Leviticus 17 tells us that. Now, let me first explain to you what that is and then we're going to go to the Bible and look at Leviticus uh, chapter 17. I'm probably sure we're not going to read everything, but um, we can go and then look at Leviticus chapter 17. Now, why is it that on the on the right side we see the picture of the earth? We see we see um, earthy and heavenly. I'm going to tell you why. If you if you if you get this, if you get this, then you you are you are a person that will enjoy the rest of the Bible. The earthly is the courtyard and the heavenly is the holy and most holy place. Why is that so? Think about it. Most churches, they stay into the uh, into preaching about uh, Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and we resurrected, right? But what else? Well, when Christ came to die for our sin, he came to the earth, right? So, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is the altar of sacrifice, which happened on the earth. His resurrection is the bronze laver, meaning he was purified. And then, the message of the sanctuary tells us that later on, he went up into the heaven, and that's actually found in the book of Revelation chapter 1, where John sees Jesus Christ walking in the midst of the candlesticks. So while most churches are talking just about the altar of sacrifice and the bronze liver, but be, they are talking about it, but they don't know what, they, what it means. They are just preaching on 
Christ died for us for our sins and he was resurrected and that's our hope. That's not the hope. Well, if Christ died and resurrected, that's not the hope. How about the rest of the message? The candlesticks, the altar of incense, the showbread, and the ark of the covenant. All of these actually is part of the hope. It's not, the just, it's not just that Christ died and resurrected. Because what if he died and resurrected and he says, I'm just going to not come back anymore to the earth. There is no hope for us then. And so that is why the earthly was the, the courtyard, in a sense, is the earth. That's where Christ died and resurrected. And then the heavenly is where he is right now interceding for us. That is the message of the sanctuary in a nutshell. Two places, the earth and heaven. Christ died for our sins and resurrected. That was the earth. And then after that, he went up to the heaven to minister for our be on our behalf. And that is the other part of the sanctuary. Now, why is the sacrifice, outer sacrifice in I would say about the door? Uh, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 17. And I'm going to take my Bible this time. Actually, let me see if I can, uh, if I can use, um, if I can use the, instead of the Bible, I'm going to try to, to use the, if I can do that right here. Let me see if I can see that. Okay. No, I will not be able to see it. So I'm going to have to use my Bible in that case then. I was trying to, I was trying to, to use the, the screen for the, but I couldn't. Now, Bible says, Leviticus chapter 17, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Israel, and say unto them, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded, saying, what men, what men soever there be of the house of Israel. You know what? Let me go to the uh, New King James instead. I know some people may not be able to um, catch the the old English of the King James Version. Verse number 3. Whatever men of the house of Israel who kills an ox or lamb or goat in the camp, or who kills it outside the camp, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from, from among his people, to the end that the Israelites may bring their sacrifices which they offer in the open field, that they may bring them to the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting to the priest, and offer them as peace offerings to the Lord. And the, and the priest shall sprinkle the blood on the altar of the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and burn the fat for a sweet aroma to the Lord. They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons, after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever for them throughout their generation. So, and, and we can read throughout the other, throughout the rest of the chapter of Leviticus 17. What it means is, by looking actually by looking at let me go back to the to the slide before that so right here by looking at the gate if you were to if you were to kill an animal I would sell off the gate and meaning it is not for God for if you are trying to kill an animal for your sin and you kill I would sell off the gate it's not for God it has to be inside of the gate on the altar of sacrifice and you can see the little horns on the four corners that's for the priest to put the blood on the horn and later on we'll see what the horn actually means but for right now that's the that's the purpose of it so what it means is when you get inside is is only when you get inside of the gate or through the gate that anything you're going to be doing is for God, and then God will accept that sacrifice because you wanted Him to forgive you of your sin. And the art of sacrifice is the first place to start. In a spiritual sense, the art of sacrifice represents repentance from, of sin. You want God to remove sin. 
And I want to ask that question. Do you know what the name Jesus mean? means? What does Jesus mean? And I can promise you, the major 99% or 90% of Christians do not know what Jesus means. And I won't tell you that. I'm going to wait for your answer. I, I, I would not tell you what Jesus actually means. I'll wait for your answer in the comments after. And so when you, when, you, when, you, when you put the comment, tell me, what do you think the name Jesus means? And then I'll tell you what it means. For right now, I will not say it. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next part. Now, he, Jesus, the Son of God, the promised one of Israel, whose power had conquered death and called it and called its captives from the grave. That's actually um, Matthew chapter 27. Was in tears, not of ordinary, ordinary, ordinary grief, but of intense, irrepressible agony. His tears were not for himself, though he well knew whither his feet were tending. Before him lay Gethsemane, the scene of his approaching agony. The sheep gate, interestingly, the sheep gate, whoa, that's a big word. The sheep gate, remember, there was a gate where you bring in the sheep or the goat or the bull. Yes, the sheep gate, the sheep gate, so when you pass through the gate, the first thing you're going to get to is the altar of sacrifice. So the sheep gate also was inside, through which for centuries the victims for sacrifice had been led, and which was to open for him when, him, when he should be brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And so Jesus Christ, looking through the gate, he was going to walk through the gate, and the first thing he was going to go through was the altar of sacrifice, where he brought himself as a lamb to the slaughter. The altar of sacrifice points to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Mount Golgotha. Not far not for distant was Calvary, the place of crucifixion. Upon the path which Christ was soon to tread, must fall the horror of great darkness as he should make his soul an offering for sin. Now, by the way, if you keep hearing um, the window behind me um, making noise because it, we have a high wind outside, so it's pushing it. So that's the case. And, and so that was taken from the book Great Controversy, page 18 and page 19. And so as soon as you get through the gate, the first thing you get through is the altar of sacrifice. Let's move on. I have seen a device representing a bullock standing between a plow and an altar with the inscription, ready for either, willing to swelter in the weary furrow or to bleed on the altar of sacrifice. This is the position the child of God should ever be in, willing to go where duty calls, to deny self, and to sacrifice for the cause of truth. And actually, if you think about it, another aspect of the uh, of the message of the altar of sacrifice was Jesus said, "If any man will come after me, after me, let him deny himself and pick up his cross daily." And so, the picking of the cross is the altar of sacrifice. Did you guys catch that? I don't know if you guys cut that part, but. If you cut that part, praise God. Now, the Christian church was founded upon the principle of <laughs> sacrifice. Or, oh, uh, interestingly, if any man will come after me, says Christ, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, I hope you cut that part. He requires the whole heart, the entire affections. Testament for the Church, Volume 5, page 307, paragraph 1. Let's move on. The Lord has a great work for us to do, and He invites us to look to Him, to trust in Him, to walk with Him, to talk with Him. He invites us to make an unreserved surrender or sacrifice 
of all that we have and all to him, that when he shall call upon us to sacrifice for him, we may be ready and willing to obey. And Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now I beseech you brethren, I beseech you brethren to put to bring your body as a living sacrifice unto God. I will basically keep paraphrasing that part for you. Uh, moving on. We shall enjoy the fullness of divine grace upon only as we give only as we give all to Christ. We shall know the meaning of true happiness only as we keep the fire burning on the altar of sacrifice. God will bequeath the most in the future to those who have done the most in the present. Each day under different under different circumstances, he tries us. And in each true-hearted endeavor, he chooses his workers, not because they are perfect, but because they are willing to work unselfishly for him, and he sees that through connection with him, they may gain perfection. Our High Calling, page 191. Now, the altar of sacrifice, what is it? Well, let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 12, from verse 1 to verse 12. I'll show you the whole chapter, but I'm not going to go through all the chapter. And if you didn't know what the other sacrifice is, even then, even now, we're going to read this passage from the Bible and see what it's talking about. Now, if you know your Bible, in Exodus chapter 3 through chapter 12, or chapter yeah, chapter 12 is the 10 plagues. Did you guys know that? Okay, if you didn't know that, go to your Bible, Exodus chapter 3 through chapter 12. You're going to find the 10 plagues that hit Egypt when the Israelites were in bondage in or in captivity in Egypt. And in chapter 12 was the last plague, which is the, the death of the firstborn from the beast to Pharaoh. Now, let's read that one now. Now, the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be, the, shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day, or on the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. Keep that in mind, a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Don't forget that, a lamb. And go back to the book of John chapter 1 verse 29, when John saw Jesus walking and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away, uh, now, that takes away the sins of the world. Verse number 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. Don't forget that part, without blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Verse number 8. Then they shall eat it, I mean the people, the Israelite, shall, the, the Israelite, they shall eat the flesh of on that night, roasted in fire, with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat it raw. So if some of you here like medium rare meat, trust me, you are doing something very, very, very abominable. Do not eat it raw, nor boil at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its leg and its entrails. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, and your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in, the, in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And go back to John chapter 13, you're going to find Jesus instituted, instituting the Lord's Passover or the Lord's Supper. Interestingly. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinances. Now, let me say something very quick about um, eating raw meat. People like to eat um, medium rare meat or something like that, which is, I think is disgusting. Um, but I, let me tell you why it is a bad thing. Because if when you're eating raw meat, there is blood in it. And what does God say? What does God say about blood? You have to know this. Leviticus chapter chapter 17, as we went earlier in that chapter. Let me read to you why we should not be eating blood or raw meat, but it has to be it has to be well cooked to take all the blood out with water and and roast it. Let me tell you why. Leviticus chapter 17. I'm gonna read from my Bible. Chapter 17, Leviticus chapter, Leviticus chapter 17, verse number, um, verse number 9, or verse number 8. And you, you know what, let me actually use my computer, because I have the KJV Bible. And since I have the KJV, I'm going to look at this from the, a new, from the a newer version. Okay, verse number 8. Also, you sh uh, I'm, I'm looking at Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 8. Also, you shall say to them, Whatever man in the house of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell among you, who offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle, tabernacle of meeting, to offer it to the Lord, that man shall be cut off from among his people. And whatever man, listen to this, and whatever men of the house of Israel or all of the strangers, so it's not just Israelites, it's everybody else. You can be Americans, um, you can be uh, you can be from the you can be US citizens, Canadians, Mexicans, Haitians, Dominicans, Cubans, um, from uh, Panamaeans, Belizean, Puerto Rican, Jamaican, uh, you you go on. Whatever place you are from, you are part of it too. It's not just the Israelites. So you might be thinking, oh, uh, Mario, this is only for the Israelites. No. He says, house of Israel or of the strangers. If you are not part of the Israelites, you are you were called a stranger. So that means anybody else in the world, including Israelites, he says this. Whatever men of the house of Israel or anybody else on this planet who dwell among you, who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood. And I will cut him off from among his people. Meaning, God will destroy you or kill you. Why? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Interestingly, when they bring somebody into the hospital, first thing they want to do is they want to find somebody who has blood and give that person blood. Interestingly, I don't know why, but maybe maybe right here we have the idea. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make a torment for your souls, for it is the blood that makes a torment for the soul. So, in a sense, to receive forgiveness of sins, to be washed away from sins, is the blood that does this. Ha. Huh. So, the life of the flesh is in the blood. If you're eating blood, you're eating life. And you can't. Why? Because you cannot give life. Think about that part now. Only Christ gives life. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, No one among you, shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who dwell among you eat blood. Whatever men of the house of Israel, or of the certain of Israel, or the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or birds that, they, that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust, 
you need before you eat any meat take out the blood do not eat the blood do not eat the blood my friends for it is the life of the flesh its blood sustains life because you cannot give life you cannot eat blood therefore i say to the children of israel you shall not eat the blood of, of any flesh for the life of all flesh is its blood whosoever eats it shall be cut off or died or dead and so now let's move on now we're looking at we're looking at I had to take that detour to explain to you why blood is not supposed to be something we need to eat. Okay, so let's go now to Exodus chapter 12. Now I'm going to look at that part right here that says um, where it says yes, they shall verse number eight. They shall eat it. Now first of all, it has to be a lamb without blemish because. The lamb was supposed to be perfect lamb. And if you think about it, Jesus was a perfect lamb. No broken bones, no broken anything, just a perfect lamb. No sinful mark found in Christ at all. So the lamb that was being used in the past was supposed to reflect Christ coming as a perfect lamb to die for our sin. And because his blood gives us life and since he didn't he didn't um sin he had a perfect blood that could cleanse us from sin verse number eight roasted in fire unleavened what is unleavened bread if you think about it the word leaven or leaven however it's in english jesus said to his disciple be aware of the leaven bread of the Pharisees. What does that even mean? Well, leaven bread means the false teaching or false doctrine that the Pharisees were, were, were preaching. And so when you're eating unleavened bread, then it's a bread that is only in its purity or perfect. It's not leavened with sin. It's not tempted with sin, but it's a perfect bread. And with bitter herbs. Now, bitter herbs. What does that even mean, bitter herbs? Why? Well, friends, let me tell you this. Um, you need, we have to be, we have to feel bitter against sin. We have to have a sorrow for sin. We have to be in a, in a state where we hate sin so much that we won't even want to think about sinning. Bitter herbs. Bitter herb means you want to pour out your soul on re to repent of your sin. And again, the question is, what does Jesus mean? Put your comments down when you when you I, I, when you when you see this video. Put your comments down and let me know what you think about it. What does Jesus mean? Now, um, and. Everything else is basically in this chapter. Now, the path, what is the Passover? Well, God says it himself. The Passover is when he sees the blood on the on the door of the post or the post of the door, he will pass over the house. And that's what the word Passover means. And what does that mean for us today? Well, it means that God did not desire to see animals being killed for the forgiveness of sins. These were basically representations of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I give you right now two, two places. Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. Go back and read that for yourself. And right now we just looked at Exodus chapter 12 verse... And right now we just looked at Exodus chapter 12 verse 1 to verse 12. And so this was... A, 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 uh, a what you call it again a covenant for for us to learn from not that we have to do it anymore but we have to learn from that and so um, 
what does that mean for us today? Well, friends, if you think about it, um, anything in the Bible has to be also applicable for us today. And so, what is the sacrifice of Christ? How is that applicable for us today? Well, let's see. And that's why I'm gonna I'm gonna now um, go now to present application in our time. Anything that happened maybe in the, in the past out of five or ten years is is a, something for us to learn to understand what's actually going on. So is relationship with God costly? Catholic Herald. Well, um. I found that post that was in June chap in June 2015 and says from Bishop David McGough he says to live as God's children we must sacrifice something of our sinful past and as the Seventh Day Adventist Bible believing Christians even though I do not agree with the teachings of the Catholic Church or I mean the papacy in the sense I said it again. Not the people, but the, but the, but the teaching. I love all the, I, I, I love everybody, but the teaching that they teach of the, the Catholic Church teaches, I am against it because it is not biblical. Now, even then, this right here, I do agree with it because it is true that as God's children, we must sacrifice something of our sinful past. And that is, leave sin alone. Leave sin. Sacrifice sin. Leave sin alone. And let Christ's blood purify us from sin. Now, let's see what it says. Now, um, for a, and it says right here, for a nomadic people, the sacrifice of any animal was costly. We are reminded that our own relationship with God is costly. Is that true? Hmm. Is that true? I say no. You know why? Because it was God that actually gave... So, think about it. Think about it. Why would God ask us... Let's say we're living, well, let's say we're living back in the time of the Israelites. Why would God ask us to sacrifice animals if we didn't have any. Well, guess what? God was the one providing the animals for us to sacrifice to Him. We didn't have to worry about getting the animals. Look at Abraham and Isaac. When God told Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac, Isaac said, Father, we have the fire, we have the wood. Where is the animal? What did Abraham say? God will provide. No friend, it is not costly. It is not costly. Ha! Huh. It is not costly because God provides for us. He provides the animal for the sacrifice. Don't forget that. Now, the, the, the bishop, of course, that's why I say um, I, I don't agree with the teaching because it is unbiblical. We are reminded that our own relationship with God is costly, which is not true. All it costs us is to give up our filthy rags and our sinful habits. That's not that's not that's not costly. That's a good bargain for us. In choosing to live as his children, faithful to his way, we must sacrifice something of our sinful past. In this sense, every genuine relationship is costly. That is not true either. Costing what? Talking about money or something else? I don't know. Relationships are costly, and Christ's death paid a price that lay beyond the selfishness of our sinful humanity. Think about that part. Now, if I say Mario right here, he is right. Because Christ's death was costly. But think about it. Was it costly for us or for God? And trust me, was it costly for God anyways? No, because God was the one that wanted to make that sacrifice for us. 
Because he knew that we would not make that sacrifice at all. So he said, you know what? I know there is a price to pay, but guess what? That price is nothing. I'm just going to pay it for you all because you cannot pay that price. Think again. It is costly for us because we would not be able to pay that price of sin. But God says, there is nothing costly for me. So no, to have a relationship with God is not costly because God provided it for us. Because nothing is costly for Him. Now, of course, talk about that. If you talk, if you go talk about Christ dying on the cross, yes, that's a bad thing because we didn't want that to happen. But that was the only way to pay the price. And God said, "That's easy. I can do that. That's easy for me. It's not costly at all." So no, it is not costly. Nothing is costly for God. Everything is easy. We think it's hard, but it's actually easy for Him. Now. Every celebration of the Eucharist, first of all, Eucharist is a satanic thing. I want you guys to know that right now. It's a satanic thing. Because in the Eucharist, the priest or the papacy or the Catholic Church believe that they can recreate the body of Christ. That is blasphemy and that is called spiritualism. Yes. And if there are any Catholic right now that's going to be listening to that, 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 that if there are any Catholic right now um, listening to this, I want you to know, I have nothing against Catholic people, but that teaching of the Eucharist is of the devil. Because the Bible does not speak about this at all. As a matter of fact, um, they do it thoroughly the wrong way. Look at how Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. And see if that's the way they actually do it in the churches today. No. The Eucharist means that the priest can recreate the body of Christ. Literally. And that is blasphemy. Every celebration of the Eucharist is a communion with the body and blood of the Lord. And frankly, only the priest gets to drink the, 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 the wine, in a sense. The Jesus Christ gave the bread and the wine to all the disciples. But the priest, what they do is they only give what? Well, not even. Is that even a bread? No. Nah, it's actually nothing. A reminder that Christ has already paid the price for a relationship that we should never take for granted. His life poured out on the cross would become the price of a new covenant, a new relationship with the Father. To receive his body and blood in holy communion is to give ourselves completely to a life lived with God. We become one with him who was sacrificed and in so doing we sacrifice ourselves to his will. And he says it's costly. That is not costly. Because all you are sacrificing is the pleasure of this world. That is not costly. We think it is costly because we love the world more than we love God. That's why we think it's costly, but it is not costly. Jesus said, why, why, why a man would would, would, would will the whole world and lose his soul? Or what would a man give for his soul? Nothing. But because we love the world so much and we love sin so much, actually sin is costly. And we want to live in sin. That's why we think to be living, to be have, to be in a relationship with God is costly because we hate the idea of living sin. It is not costly to have a relationship with God. Now, let's move forward. So I say this to you: If anyone says having a relationship with God is costly, it is because this person does not have a personal relationship with God. What it means? It means to walk with God. To have a personal relationship with God means to walk with God. Amos 3 verse 3 says, Can two walk together lest they agreed? Genesis chapter 5 verse 4 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was no more, for God took him to heaven. How is that costly? It is not costly. Is it? No. 
How many of you want? To, how many of you want to go to heaven? I'm sure most of you will say, "I want to go to heaven." But when it comes to costly, is that costly? No, it's not costly. If anyone says, second one, if anyone says having a relationship with God is costly, it is because this person have lost faith in God. That means to be hopeless. Hebrews chapter 11. Go with that for yourself. That's the book of the faith. If anyone tells you that having a relationship with God is costly, it is because this person does not love you whatsoever. Why? Because it means that it means that the person that person does not love Christ either. Why? Because to if you if you love God, you will keep his commandments. If you love God, you will leave sin behind. And if you love God, you will want your neighbor to also enjoy that freedom from sin that you have. It is not costly. If any man says having a, having a relationship with God is harmful or hurtful, it is either this person is an apostate Christian or the man of sin or son of perdition or the Antichrist. And right here, I leave a link for you on the bottom. You can look it up whenever you want. Now, Dangerous. National Catholic Reporter. Church is essential for faith. There are no free agent, the Pope says. And of course, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm going to tell you, I don't hate the Pope. I hope he actually repents and follows Christ. But what he says here is very harmful for people that want to actually live in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's see what he says. Pope says this. Every Christian, he said, can trace his or her faith back to parents, grandparents, teachers, or friends. I always remember the nun who taught me catechism. And I'm on there right now. I went to Catholic school for four years. All my siblings went to Catholic school as well in my country because they had a better education, or supposedly. Um, but that catechism I had to study, and I never believed in it, actually. So, and now he says, I know she's in heaven because she was a holy woman. Um, no, she's in the grave right now. Not in heaven, she's in the grave. In the Old Testament, the Pope said, God called Abraham and began to form a people that would become a blessing for the world. With great patience and with great patience and God has a lot of it, and God has a lot of it, he prepared the people of the ancient covenant and in Jesus Christ constituted them as a sign and instrument of the union of humanity with God and unity one with one another. Pope Francis described as dangerous the temptation that believed that one can have a personal, direct, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ without communion, without communion with a mediation of the church. Um, think about that part. I don't... Jesus wants to live in your heart and in my heart. I don't need to go to any church, in a sense, to have Jesus in my heart. It is good to be with the church because you get more support from your fellow brethren. But you can have a personal, direct, immediate relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember again? I said at the end, if anyone says having a relationship with God is harmful or hurtful, the person is either an apostate Christian the men of sin, son of perdition, antichrist, and the Pope just said the exact same thing. Let's see. Obviously, he said, um, it is not always easy to walk the path of faith with other people. Sometimes it's tiring. 
It can happen that a brother or sister creates problems for us and scandalizes us, but the Lord entrusted his message of salvation to human beings to us to witnesses, he said. It is through our brothers and sisters with their gifts and their limits, the Pope said, that he comes to us and makes himself known. That is not true. It is from us studying his Bible, his word, that Christ comes to us. This is what belonging to the church means. Remember, being Christians means belonging to the church. That is a false statement. If your first name is Christian, your last name is member of the church. That is a lie. Because, and I'm going to tell you exactly why it is a lie. At the end of his talk, Pope asked people to join him in things like that. Or actually, uh, he said to join him in a prayer and praying that they would never give into temptation of thinking you can do without others, without the church, that you can save yourself, or thinking you can be a laboratory Christian. Now let me tell you why this is actually a lie. Okay? Here, Christians, he said, are not manufactured in isolation, but belong to a long line of believers who handed on to the faith and challenged one another to live it fully. Yeah, all that thing. Now, Again, review and herald. Let me actually um, move that right here. Oh, no. Let me actually move this one right here. Review and herald. Let's see this. Let church members bear in mind that the church, that the fact that their names are registered on the church books will not save them. They must show themselves approved of God, workmen that need to be not to be ashamed. Day by day, they ought to build their characters in accordance with Christ's direction. They ought to abide in Him, constantly exercising faith in Him. Thus, they will grow up to the full stature of men and women in Christ. Wholesome, cheerful, and grateful Christians led by God step by step into clearer and still clearer light. Second part, many of those whose names are registered on the church books are not Christians. They have not a genuine experience. If they were copying their pattern, Jesus Christ, they would pray more and cry less. They would strive to be liberals together with God. Their sincere faith in Christ would lead to entire dependence on Him and perfect cooperation with Him. Now, let me say this to you. This is the last slide. Um, see, I have a I have a Catholic friend. Uh, and uh, we were talking one day, and she said to me, and just randomly, she said to me, "Hey, um, do they actually um, do they teach in your church that um, do they teach in your church to have a uh, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ?" And she said, "Because in my church, they don't. They actually discourage to have a." personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I told her, yes, I know that already. Um, but in my church, that's the first thing we do. Um, the first thing we introduce uh, the youngsters is to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what I'm seeing is you can do all the rituals that you want. Um, as the as my Catholic friend, my Catholic friend does, she goes to every single ritual and uh, all the things that they have to do. But it's not fulfilling. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is missing. And so, to, to say to somebody that to have a personal relationship 
with Jesus Christ is not a good thing, then you must be against Christ. And if you're not gathering with Christ, then you are scattering abroad. And so, that was the art of sacrifice. We need to sacrifice something in our sin, in our past. And that is sin. We need to sacrifice sin. We need to become more like Christ in character. That's exactly what he wants us to do. Is to leave sin behind and to accept his sacrifice on the cross for us. Now again, the question is this. What does Jesus mean? And I think if you understand what Jesus means, it will give you a different aspect of what life should be as a Christian. So friends, today is Sabbath, May 16th, uh, 2020. And we looked at the first PowerPoint on the message of the sanctuary called the altar of sacrifice. And so, and so, next Sabbath, we're going to look at the second part, the bronze laver, and see what God has for us in the bronze laver. Until then, I hope you have a great rest of the Sabbath. And I hope to you guys to have a good week um, beginning uh, as of tonight. And uh, I will see you again next Sabbath, May 23rd, 2020. If I don't see you at all, or if I don't see um, tomorrow, or if I die today or anytime during the week, because that's possible, I hope that this message may give you a, uh, a boost start into falling in love with the Bible again. And if I don't see you again, I hope to see you when Christ comes the second time. Until then, bye for now.